Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Hubert Chow. I'm a software engineer at Google, and this will be the last you hear from me. Um, just here to present presenter speaker for today, uh, Peter Stroif, Very good. Um, who is a board game designer that a bunch of a bunch of us met on our trip to Germany a few weeks, well, about a month ago. So, Peter, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to give a short presentation and give you some insights into the process uh, uh, that led to the creation of this game called Krakow, 1325 AD. I gave a title to this presentation, which is a creative journey, because I'd like to share with you a little bit about the last four years of my life, in which many things have happened, but one thing that's been a consistent part of that is the design and development and publication and sell sales of this board game that I designed. Uh, I'm here. I thank you very much for your invitation, Hubert, to come and talk to you. And I'll try to keep my presentation limited to about 30 minutes. So if you have any further questions, uh, I'll be very happy to answer those. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me, just to know who is here. For me, the question would be, who am I? For you, the question is, who is this Peter guy? Uh, I'm a Dutchman. <clears throat> I'm uh, very close to 40 years old, uh, dangerously close. Um, I was born in Holland, um, grew up on a small farm. Uh, one of the things that is definitely a part of my youth and my upbringing is bo our board games, uh, playing cards with the family, uh, and also uh, role-playing games when I was uh, in high school into university. Uh, I always had an interest in creative writing although I never got published in any way. So this is my shot at redeeming myself through publishing <laughs> something I wrote. Um, in real life, I uh, studied uh, development economics. I uh, then uh, pursued a career in uh, development aid and humanitarian work, which uh, has been my uh, way of life uh, for the last 15 years. And I've worked in uh, five, six different countries over that time. Um, Within that line of work, I'm a, I'm a, ma I'm a manager of uh, the funding decisions in that kind of work. Uh, I've managed offices and projects uh, related to either long-term development in the third world or uh, humanitarian recovery after uh, uh, the tsunami and some wars and refugee crisis. That's been my normal life, you could say. Um, throughout that time, um, my board gaming has, uh, has been a big hobby of mine. I once designed a board game when I was a teenager with my brother. It was a shipping game, um, not very innovative. It never saw the light of day, and I'm not sure that the world has missed much as a result of that. Um, I've always played games, uh, wrote and designed uh, uh, role-playing game uh, adventures, uh, scenarios. So. I've been involved in the creative part of board games for most of my life. What I never intended to do in my life was to start up a company and to self-publish uh, a board game. That was something that just happened to me. Um, in my board gaming, and it has a link to the rest of my uh, story, um, I did come across uh, a game that's called Advanced Squad Leader. It is uh, one of the most complex uh, board games in the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a war game, it's a technical simulation game. Its rule book is about uh, the size of several manuals. And um, why, it's, why that has something to do with this story is that um, if you go to a tournament of this board game, you spend about three days and every game lasts about five to eight hours and your opponent sits across the table, like you, like this, and you will play this game for that long, and you will have intense concentration. So you will focus completely on the rules, the options, the dice rolls, and you will manage your game throughout. So if you go to a tournament, which I've done regularly over the last 10 years, you put yourself through quite an unusual mental effort. Um, okay. Why that is... Interesting yep, is thanks. that why that is interesting is that uh, I went to uh, the creation of this game happened 
the day after such a tournament. So I was in Sweden in uh, 2005. I spent three days without sleep, but with intense concentration trying to win this board game tournament. I did not win it, but in the bus on the way to the airport, I had an enormous amount of creative energy. I have analyzed it later and thought, okay, I released this tension from my brain about how to play this game, and now there's a, this energy wants to go somewhere. So I was sitting in the back of a bus in Sweden, and I was suddenly thinking about designing a board game. And I thought back to my youth when I was, uh, when at home we used to play a four-player card game, a, a typical Dutch, very traditional and boring card game. But you played it with a team of, uh, you played it only with four players, two players in each team. Then I started thinking, okay, that's an interesting mechanic. It's an engine for a board game. It would be nice if you play, if you use that engine and you put a map board in the middle. So that what you're doing with these cards while you're playing it is, is aimed at influencing a map. Um, then, let me see if I should take one further. Yes. Good. So I was sitting in the back of the bus thinking about a card game with four players and a map board. Then I started thinking each card should be different. And the cards should bring about a certain flavor and a story. And I designed in my head four secret groups, which would be the four colors of the cards. So instead of spades and diamonds, there would be four colors, which represent a certain group. These groups in the game are called the underworld in red, the good and decent citizens in green, the secret societies in yellow, and the monks and mystics in blue. So the cards would have, a special, would have these colors, and each card would represent the, an attempt of one of these colors groups to increase their influence on that map board, which was the idea of medieval, some kind of medieval city. So the car, each card would be different, and each card would tell a small story about how this group would try to increase influence and where. As you see here in the presentation, <coughs> There was also the idea that there are uh, enmity between some of these colors. So where you see the arrows, the underworld and the good and de decent citizens are each other's arch enemies. The underworld and the secret societies are somewhat aligned. The secret societies and monks are arch enemies, etc. So that was something that I wanted to build into the, into the card system. What does that mean? That means that each color of a card has two enemy cards, more or less. The cards in the red color and the cards in the yellow color would be fairly strong enemies to green, whereas blue cards would be very weak enemies to green. So this idea started shaping the, this idea of how this medieval city and these groups would work, <coughs> translated into different values. So a green card would have four values in the support of four different colors, and a green card would have four values when it's played against one of these uh, colors. What I then decided is that if you design a board game with four players and they play in teams, that's lovely, but obviously it would be more interesting if there's only one winner. So I decided that these there would, there would need to be two scoring mechanisms. One is on the map board, what happens what you score on the map board, which is visible to everyone, would be one scoring track, you could say. But then there should be a second scoring track where you do not play together with your partner, but where you play for yourself. And that scoring track depends on the colors of the cards. So the idea was born very, almost immediately, you could say. I need four secret identities with a certain relationship between them. I need to, people to mix up in teams of two, They'll play a card game that is somewhat related to the uh, uh, card game that I uh, used to play at home. <coughs> and there are two ways of scoring. That means that you will play against your own partner for the entire game. Okay. So I went home and I went to work. As you can see from this picture, I'm not much of an artist. 
but I did draw the first map of Krakow and this is it. Uh, so I decided there should be uh, six or seven areas, and each area would have a name, like the palace, or this, uh, the, the harbor, or uh, the barracks of the army, because those, naming those areas would create the possibility to have a story on the card that links to this particular area. So, for example, a card called Army Rebellion, if that card would succeed, would score, the result would be felt in that area and not in the other areas. What you can see on the top right is the first set of cards that I made. As you can see, uh, not very nice to look at. But the, the ultimate concept was already there. Eight values about how each card interacts with cards of another color. And a set of values that tells you if this card scores, where do you get what? What is the reward in terms of the map board? Okay, um, I started playing this with uh, two of the uh, four people who have joined me on this trip to the US. Uh, my wife and a friend from Switzerland and another friend from the United States who was happened, happened to visit me. And I can say it immediately worked from the first time we played one set of cards, one hand of cards, and looked at the mechanism, I realized, wow, there's something in this. Because this is different from any other board game I know. There, is an, there are two levels of interest. And the idea that you play with your partner, but against each other, through a secret second scoring mechanism, is really strong. It has a strong attraction. It will interest people. Um, what, of course, I also found, in a way, was a way to deliver some of my worldviews through the stories <laughs> and uh, uh, the ideas. Um, because each card would be different, each card would have a story to tell. And you'll see some examples of that later. Uh, so, before I shock you with my worldview, well, <laughs> if you haven't played the game yet, uh, the, all four secret groups are crooks. They, none of them are better or more honest or more more uh, generous than others. They are all battling for influence. They just use some different methods. Um, and the second idea, I think, was that medieval times, yeah, medieval times and modern times are not that different, really, if you look slightly below the surface. This was these were some of my ideas. If if you say where does this inspiration come from, uh, certainly the novels of Terry Pratchett. Uh, spring to mind. So you create a crazy world with a strong internal logic, you could say, and within that logic you show that even though the world looks different and moves different, it's still very much like ours. Um, okay, let me see if I need to press a button. Yes, so this is an example of uh, Peter's world view. Fast foods are the creation of the underworld. Um, and uh, if they sell their fast foods in an area called the slums, and they will, if they score, they will get much following in that area, and they will gain gold. So I also added the idea that to, make, to, to relate the story and the cards closer, I needed different types of influence, not just all the same, so I created four types of influence, which represent a certain flavor to what your what what your what the reward is. They are following power, style, and gold. So on the left you see uh, two columns, the scores where you can see uh, that in supporting uh, the cards of a different color, the scores are the four on the left. So you see there that a underworld card like this is not useful in supporting the good and decent citizens. It's in this case fairly even to the others, etc. And then your red cards would be stronger in obstructing and playing against a green card that is started by another by another player. What I did not have at that time was any idea of uh, where to place this game. I had 
as you've seen so far, it's quite generic. You cannot say it's not Holland, it's not America, it's not a fantasy world. So I was looking for a place to put it. And together with my American friend and with my wife, I went on a holiday very soon after I, played, I started designing this game. And uh, we wanted to go to Poland. And this was one of our uh, objectives. We have a strong interest in history of the Second World War. And one place we wanted to really see for ourselves was the uh, concentration camp at Auschwitz. So we, I'm pretty sure we then Googled to find <laughs> the nearest place. If you want to see Auschwitz, where do you sleep? And the nearest place to sleep, if you want to visit Auschwitz, is Krakow. And when you, when the three of us drove into this town, we were quite amazed to see, in a way, how it presented itself as the most suitable place for this board game. In the car, me and my American friend were talking about the board game I designed, and we were talking about where should it be, you know any nice place, it should be near, a bit far, a bit romantic, and not totally where nobody knows anything about. So, um, if you go to Krakow, if you've been to Krakow, you realize it's an amazing medieval city. It was not damaged in the Second World War. Uh, and it has a magnificent castle, an old town that is in a very uh, well-preserved state, uh, fantastic medieval taste in food. Um, and it, happened, it happens to have an amazing castle that is also an enormous museum. And that, in that museum, you find, we found out that it was the capital of Poland in the Middle Ages. So this is me uh, in a, a typical pose, concentrated as you see, uh, at the Wawel Castle, reading the legends of this place. So once we were there, I realized this is it. This must be it. The name I then gave to the game was A Play of Shadows in Krakow, 1490 AD. Of course, in later edits, it became, it ended up shorter. It became Krakow. Um, let me see. This is the next place related to the development of this game. Because about a month after I visited Krakow, <coughs> it was my last holiday in Europe before I went to this place. Uh, this is uh, Chalang in Aceh in Indonesia. And it was uh, devastated by the Indian Ocean tsunami. And I had the, uh, the luck to be uh, to find myself a job there for about seven months. So I worked for an uh, English uh, humanitarian agency, and in my suitcase, not really knowing what to expect from a place like this, I put this beautiful map that I showed you, and the not so beautiful cards that I also showed you. And I thought, well, there will be some people there who might have some spare time. I hope. I'm pretty sure there's not going to be that much entertainment going on around town. So that is a good opportunity. And the best thing is, I'm the head of the office. <laughs> um, so I might be able to convince and influence some people to play this game with me, and maybe they'll even enjoy it. <laughs> so uh, after just a week or two, I was uh, I showed my, uh, my, my creation to some of my colleagues. And as they indeed had nothing left, to do, and I was the line manager for almost all of them, they agreed to join in. And on the beach in this town, uh, we made a set of beams, and we made a set of small stones representing the influence of the two teams, and we started playtesting this. Um, so it was really amazing for me to see that I was playing this game I designed with people from India, Pakistan, the Philippines, Indonesia, all over Asia almost, and none of them had ever played a board game before, and they all really started to enjoy it. And this gave me a very, it gave me a lot of confidence that, yeah, this is unusual. They, they, there must be something in it. Um, what I also did there, because I had some spare time, is uh, to write up all the stories that go with the. Uh, intrigue cards and to write the first draft of the rules in uh, something like something like this. So these were the first rules that I 
road. Um, of course, in seven months of testing this game, there, was a, there were a lot of changes that were needed. Mostly it was making it easier. Uh, coming from this background where I play a very complex board game, you always tend to over, overdo it. Too many rules, too many victory conditions, too many, the scoring was too complex, etc. So as I, every time I had to decide, can I cut this out and will it get better or will it get worse? And I also um, designed the engine of this board game, which I will show you at the end of the presentation, uh, because I would like to show you a little bit of how I uh, managed the playtest sessions and how I ended up with the cards, the values, uh, as they are now. Um, I did this in an Excel sheet, and I can safely say that Excel sheet in two years of time went through at least 100 versions. I, because I tried out almost anything, uh, more areas, uh, etc., all sorts of different values. Okay, let me see. After seven months there, I re I returned to. Um, let me just check the next one. Yes, um, I returned to Holland. Um, where I uh, took my prototype uh, to some publishers. Uh, one of them was quite uh, interested, um, had a lot of good comments on what he thought was too difficult, the market wouldn't like it, etc. But if he were to publish my board game, he would want to make quite a few changes. And one of the changes uh, was that he would want to remove all the text. So no titles to the cards and no stories. In other words, Peter's worldview was not going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one compromise that I was not interested in making. So I decided that is not going to happen. I then met up uh, through my workplace with uh, my former workplace with uh, Melchior van Rijn, who is the artist who did all the drawings for this, uh, this game. He's the husband of a, of a co-worker of mine. And we started talking about doing this uh, together. He's a beginning, he was a beginning illustrator. And we started talking about how we make these games. Uh, we started talking about, can we make this game? Just the two of us. Uh, and how would we do this? So he made a number of drawings. And I'm going to show you a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how uh, we made the drawings that go with this game. Um, I also got some quotations from uh, publishers uh, and, and uh, publishing houses and, uh, and the suppliers of pieces that go with these kind of games to get some idea what the investment might be. And uh, I also met a number of Dutch guys who had self-published before and they gave us a lot of fantastic tips without them. I wouldn't know how we would have started off. So uh, we used a Dutch printer to intermediate between us, us and the Polish printer who finally published the game, etc. Um, they also gave me the impression that it is possible for someone without any experience to interact with uh, publishers and design and publish your own game. It was also clear to me what it would require in terms of capital, so I had to talk to my business partner, who is my wife, and we more or less decided that uh, two-thirds of our savings should be put aside if we were going to go ahead, if we would not find a publisher in the end, so that we might risk making it ourselves. Then, um, about six months after this, uh, I resigned from my old job and I returned to this very place in Aceh. I, uh, uh, I was rehired for the same job, in the same desk, at the same desk, in the same office to continue working there for another nine and a half months for the closure of this uh, response to the, to the tsunami in Aceh. And of course, many people there were still there that I'd left one year before. So I knew I should take the next prototype with me <laughs> because I could count on them being willing to play. Once again, I was the head of the office, so that also was very helpful. <laughs> what we then started doing, and this is a very interesting process, uh, the artist Melchior, he was in the Netherlands and I was in Aceh. And we started working on all the pictures that you now see on the cards 
And I want to share with you how that process worked because it's something that I've thoroughly enjoyed. So I had written a story for every card, for every card in the game. And it's a story that's about a paragraph long. I'm not going to read it out to you, but this is the story on top of the card called Protection Racket. And it's a card that belongs to the underworld. Um, so the, I sent Melchior the story at the top. And then in the, in the middle, you see the amount of text I thought would, there would be space for on the card. In other words, the first is just background. The second line is what I thought might fit on the card to support uh, to support the, the illustration. And then at the bottom I wrote um, my suggestion to the artist. So my suggestion to Melchior for this uh, protection record was, can you draw for me a poor shop owner standing in his store, maybe he's selling eggs and cheese, facing two gentlemen who clearly frighten him. The first one is a well-dressed, smooth-looking figure, maybe one of the organized criminals from another card. The second is a muscle man, and they threatened by his presence alone. So I sent this to uh, the artist. He made a sketch. He sent the sketch back to me, and I would then comment on the sketch to see if he, he, should, he should make changes. So this was a creative process that, uh, that repeated itself for all 64 cards. We produced them roughly at the rate of uh, three cards every two weeks, I think. So it was quite an intensive process. Um, let me see. This is a drawing that did not make it. Uh, this is the original drawing for the card called Black Death. The story I sent was that uh, rats came to Krakow and the plague uh, broke out and um, people didn't do much about it in terms of public health and uh, they just uh, prayed for deliverance and they did not save all of them. So there was, the reason this card did not make it is that it was not clear enough. It wasn't clear enough why this was a picture of Black Death. We got quite far on this one. So I said to Melchior, that's not all right. Can you draw me something else? And we uh, uh, made a small, we ventured out in something we all know, which is the bring out your dead from, uh, uh, sorry, Monty Python. Monty, Python. From Monty Python, yes. So he, can we have a cart full of dead people? and uh, someone calling out to bring out your dead. So this was his first uh, sketch, and I said, yeah, I like it. And then he drew it like this. This looks nice. But uh, I said to him, but Melchior, I don't like that there's a live guy on the card, because this takes, makes it too cartoonesque for my liking, and this makes you wonder whether they are really dead or not. So. This was the final uh, Black Death. The happy man who survived got taken out. Then the one thing, the most difficult part in the entire design process, I would say, uh, was the struggle to fit everything on the cards. Um, I cannot un uh, underrepresent how hard and difficult the process was for us illustrator and designer who both never designed a board game uh, to get all the information on the card in a way that was most attractive and most successful. So the one on the left is what I made in uh, more or less what I brought with me, brought, brought back with me from, from Arche. So the values were all already tested. Then we went to the one on the left, uh, sorry, on the right. Uh, <laughs> And one thing you will see, the one on the left here is the final one. And what you will see is that the, we, all the text that was not flavor text was removed. So the words were all taken out. And that was quite uh, helpful. But you can see here on the, uh, on the, on the right, you see the picture of, um, of the peasant revolt. And this is how, we, this is how many spaces we needed. 
we work on 63 by 88 millimeters, and the printer tells you then don't do any, don't put anything on the on the outside outer three millimeters, four millimeters on each side. So you have a very limited space. And of course, as you can see, these cards have quite a number of values. Um, one thing that I just to show you, for example, throughout the first part, we had the two columns with those values, and they squeezed the they squeezed the picture, so the picture was smaller, and that forced the artist to make a more rectangular or almost uh, square picture, which really limits what an artist can do. So as you can see, when you then see the afterlife in its final form, you have a much wider picture because you move the, the columns uh, away from each other. So that was an amazing uh, amount of work, I can say. Um, right, let me see. So at the end of my second stint in, in Indonesia, I can say that the cards were more or less uh, the way we wanted them. And we'd gone through almost one and a half years of playtesting, trying out all sorts of versions. So I was pretty confident that it was very solid. That it could not really go wrong. Um, I returned to Holland in February 2008, and we made the decision to self-publish this game. Um, we made 2,000 copies. Uh, I started my own company, which is just me. Uh, and my and uh, the spare bedroom in our house that's the office um, and our bicycle seller is the storage uh, since we don't ride bicycles um, I made my own website with the assistance of uh, a, a web designer um, and I got involved on a site called board game geek which is an amazing resource for board games and Again, this was from, a, from advice of other people in the board gaming industry who I had met, who said, you must do this. Well, it's been a... Uh, without Board Game Geek, I can say that this game would have not sold more than 50 copies, probably only family and friends and people we could force at gunpoint to buy it, <laughs> to part with their money. So, um, decided to take the risk to uh, publish this using our own savings. I think... The most exciting part was now we're, we're going to do this exactly the way we want it. And we're going to put it out to the public. If they don't like it, well, then we'll retire with uh, much less money and much more board games in our, uh, <laughs> in our cellar. But we would have tried it. And uh, the idea of not really having to compromise, because I believe that this was something unusual or at least uh, worth pursuing. Um, then my friend, uh, then we had to draw the map board because so far I've shown you only uh, things about the cards. So this was my uh, Corel Draw map board. Uh, I'm quite fond of it. <laughs> <laughs> you might not have bought it if it was in this form. I respect that. So. This is what I brought from uh, from Ache. This is what we played on. Um, this is a sketch we found of medieval Krakow. Um, this is around the year 1500. Originally, the game was placed somewhere around that time. We later changed the dates uh, back to 1325 AD for some reasons. Um, so. This is uh, present-day Krakow, and you can see the shape of the old city very, very well. Everywhere where there are trees, that is just inside the old city wall. Um, interesting also is that the, the river that you see here on the, on the bottom, uh, several of the larger tri uh, tributary rivers of the Vistula River are now big streets. So they were rivers then, uh, they are streets now. In the front of this picture, you see the, the, the castle of Wawel. This is what Melchior drew first. This is a sketch, and you can see the shape there. Then we started messing with it. So I'll just show it to you uh, in rapid succession. We started trying to fit everything 
and it moved around quite a bit. It's starting to look more uh, permanent now. Then he drew this map. And this is what you'll find in this box. So you'll see that the, is a very interesting uh, sequence of creative interactions between the designer and the, and, the, and the artist. Basically, I don't know anything about drawing, and I don't know what works in terms of colors and shapes and what people, what, how to, how to uh, use the visual aspects for, for most effect. And Melchior did not know too much about how the game works. So I had to keep on making sure that the game itself would not work less well because it looks so nice. Um, so this was a very interesting partnership that we were in for this uh, for this project. Okay. Uh, then we had to draw ourselves the the box that you see here. Uh, this is just to sh see. Uh, you see the same tower in the picture at night and. Funnily enough, uh, at the board game fairs that we've attended, we've had Polish people come to our stand and say, wow, that's a really nice picture of Krakow. And because I recognize the castle, so they do really, uh, he did do a good job. Um, in order to make all these drawings, uh, Melchior actually uh, took a trip to Krakow and walked around there for about three days, taking pictures, trying to get some more of the uh, graphic information that he might need. And this is what it then finally looked like. So it was first published in October 2008, which is just over a year ago. This is us. We had a small event at our house that I just wanted to share with you, where we shared with uh, people who had helped us in playtesting, in giving advice, in uh, providing uh, uh, friendly uh, guidance and all through the playtesting process. So we had a small uh, affair uh, event. And uh, this is how we revealed the game to our home crowd. And of course, after we revealed it, we had to play it. And this is us meeting the market at Essen. So, this one. Um, in October 2008, we took our game to uh, Essen, the biggest uh, board game fair in the world, and we uh, started selling the game there. What has happened since uh, since this time, October 2008? We've managed to sell 1,200 of the 2,000 games we printed originally, uh, both in Europe and quite a few in the USA. Um, with some of the capital returned from the first sales, we uh, published a three-player expansion of which we've managed to sell 400. The game was nominated for a Dutch Board Game Award. Did not win the award, but we did not. Uh, that was not very likely from the start, so we're already very pleased to be nominated. Um, we got a very nice ranking on our Board Game Geek site, with many uh, people uh, scoring the, rating the game quite high. Uh, obviously, also, uh, if you allow the public to rate and comment, you also get a lot of very nasty comments. <laughs> and we uh, took them on the chin and we uh, enjoyed them as well because they were part of uh, uh, it was good that people at least expressed an opinion rather than be, be totally unknown to us um, have some interest from a United States based distributor but we have not concluded the deal yet one thing I had hoped from the very start you could say is that uh, some uh, board game publisher would jump in and want to publish this game uh, on a much bigger scale because obviously if you publish 2,000 games, you cannot uh, uh, do this in any commercially viable way. The print run is too small. The minimum is roughly four or 5,000 that any uh, real publishing company would, uh, would put in. Um, so that has not happened yet, and that has been maybe a slight disappointment, but uh, not really all that much. Two main reactions I have uh, received from hundreds and hundreds of people I've met at board game fairs and online is that they think that this game is a 
totally different gaming experience from other board games. So people who play many board games will often enjoy this game simply because the engine is totally different. You're only playing cards and you don't need to plan way ahead because you cannot and you have the secret identity. Uh, and I think secondly, a high level of appreciation for the quality of the product that we made. Although we were complete beginners in this field and we had to rely on our publisher and on our, uh, our own uh, skill in trying to make this as good as possible for quite a, quite a long time. So you see quite a large variety of uh, self-published games at a, at a fair like Essen. Some looking very good and some maybe should have worked on it a little bit longer. <laughs> um, as for the future or as for what's next with uh, Peter and his board game, I would say if a banker or an investor or a publisher would look at my experience of the last four years, I don't think he would rate it as a success story. We have managed to make a small loss every of the first two years. Uh, we did not get the publishing deal that might have generated some income and certainly we have not been rewarded financially for any of the time we've put in. However, I think uh, as the owner of this company and as the of this game, I <laughs> reserve the right that I measure its success by my own standards. Um, the goals I had I might, uh, when I started this was to recover some of the invested savings, which we did. Uh, to enjoy the experience of self-publishing a board game, uh, learn new things, and meet people around this project of mine. And I think the biggest reward that I've had in the last uh, two years in particular has been the opportunity to meet people, share something that I've created together with others, uh, and get the feedback on it. To get an email from South Africa, or Brazil, or Hong Kong, from someone who's played the game or who has a board gaming club or who really, please, can you sign my expansion, is really unusual. When we went to Essen for the first time, we said, should we, uh, if people ask, are we going to sign these things, is that, would there be any interest? And then to meet people who are delighted when you are willing to sign your name in the corner of a map board is just uh, what's the value of this you cannot you cannot say what's the monetary value of that that's just amazing and especially people play the game a lot and you at these fairs you meet real diehard board gamers you know what's in their cellar you know they have hundreds and hundreds of games and they go home from a board game fair with 20 30 50 different games so if you later hear that they've played it and they've liked it then somehow you've shared something very interesting. Um, so if I uh, look back at this whole project, then I could have a bigger bank account right now. But this idea would be in my cupboard. And I can certainly say it's been a big success if I compare those two states of the world uh, with each other. Um, for the future, I don't think my company is going to uh, live much longer. Uh, but there, of course, I'm still uh, hoping to sell most of the rest of my games. Since I own the idea and together with the artist own the artwork, if in future anyone would show up who wants to publish this game on a bigger scale, would be very interested just to get more people a chance to, to play it. Um, I have not been deterred from uh, designing or publishing another game. At least I know how it works, so if I would ever have another inspirational moment I would uh, I would consider it um, what I still think what is the what what what's something very interesting in this game to explore is the within board gaming uh, is the concept of the dual scoring which allows you a secret uh, objective as well as, a, as an open objective um, in most board games you're either totally secret uh, it's either totally secret or it's quite open. But the combination of putting in one game two scoring mechanisms, one that generates visible points and one that generates invisible points, I think there's still a lot uh, that you can explore in this. That you can make more different games with different engines. 
that would I think people would be interested in playing. Um, that's all I have to say about this game. I would like to just show you the Excel sheet, if you like. <laughs> if you help me, you work. Right. Uh, let's see. Right. So, can everybody on the VC see that, by the way? Is it, is it, does it work? Uh, uh, yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, from top to bottom, you see all the cards, 1 to uh, 56, the, uh, the, the normal cards, you could say where they belong to, the area, and the area is also numbered, and the title of the card, the rewards of this card. You can see my uh, cursor moving, yeah. yeah? The white areas are what is not possible, so in the barracks there is no following. So. I could never place any influence in this white box that I'm... Uh, there is only style and power. Tokens can be earned in the... in this. Then here are the eight values of this card. And again, the title just to be able to read this part. So here you see the support of each card for every other color and the opposing values of every card to every other color. You can imagine that these have been manipulated endlessly to try and make them as interesting and different and give you options, not create cards that are too strong, etc. I'll just go back and I'll show you So here at the bottom we see that if all the here, the total number is 58 for each color. So if you'd score all the red cards, you'd have scored a 58 influence. And the same applies to every other color of the cards. And then if you go here, you see what, how that is divided. And you see that this is not even. So the underworld is generally more likely to earn you gold. And the good and decent and the secret societies is less likely to earn you gold. So in these uh, 16, you see the division over the v different types. And then here you see the uh, the values. So in support for good and decent citizens at the bottom, you see check this, that the total support from good and decent citizens cards for good and decent citizens, uh, uh, for on green cards, supporting green cards is 58, on blue cards, supporting green cards is 43, on yellow cards, supporting um, uh, green cards is 29, and on red cards, zero, right? So these numbers, of course, have also been manipulated throughout to see how much stronger the opposing cards should be in comparison to the to the uh, base cards. And here you see the same value. So zero is the total amount of of uh, opposing points you have on all the green cards against all red cards. Again, on the green cards against all blue cards against yellow cards and against red cards. So here you see the system of these alignments uh, showing that green cards are stronger against yellow than they are against blue, for example. Let me see. So the sum of all the obstruct values is 143 and the sum of all the support values is 130, which is 1.1 times. Then uh, there is a difference between gold and others because uh, gold is an influence that can be uh, spent in different ways. 
It doesn't have to go straight to one area. You can spend it later in the game. So generally having gold is better than any other type of influence. Then I needed to make sure, which you see here, uh, I needed to make sure that from the total of all the cards, how much of the influence that you can win goes to which areas. Because it would not make sense that uh, the amount would be uh, the same because one of the areas is worth more than others. So here you see um, the calculations I did to try and keep track of this, to try and make sure that if all the cards for a certain area would score, how quickly would it fill up? If many big cards would go to an area with only limited spa uh, uh, space uh, for influence, then the later players would be disadvantaged. So this is a system I put into that. Mm, and this is my final bit, I think. So this is uh, this table shows you that uh, for every card you play, you will face 13 cards which have a value of zero against that card. Um, five cards with a value of one, uh, two card, uh, eight cards with a value of two, etc. Every card will face 55 possible other cards, because the total is 56. And this is that same number, 143. And the same applies up here. So this is the engine of the game. Sorry to take much longer than I had hoped, but I hope you have been interested. I'm very keen to answer any questions you might have. Is that now on Hubert's computer? <laughs> yes, that is now on Hubert's computer. <laughs> How did you come up with the different, um, like the loyalty or the, the style of the different categories? Because I think that, that whole cat, the whole category of having the gold that's fluid and then having the mm. fixed areas is clear than having different fixed areas like the feathers and the, and the, um, that's not the, so the, obvious. The reason I wanted to, well, there are two, two reasons. Uh, firstly, I wanted a stronger link between the card and the story and the map board so that some card will give you much power in the in the in an area but not much style points you could say or not much followers. So the idea that in the slums you can only have followers, you cannot get power or style, uh, which is fame, you could say, in that area. Uh, in the harbor, you can get certain things. So the stories would relate to those things, being either fame or, uh, or uh, followers in the harbor. And then one card would be different because the story would point you more towards following rather than fame. So uh, River Legends is a card that has an effect in the harbor because the old men tell their stories in the taverns at the harbor. And they will get you more fame and some followers and not much gold. So there was a, trying to make as much a link as possible uh, between the storytelling and the actual uh, card. Uh, the other reason was that um, I wanted to have these special effects. Uh, where a card might give, have a special effect on followers or on uh, the power that you have. So that's why I needed different boxes in the different areas. Um, when you explain the game to new players, they often ask, you, oh, so what's the difference between, for the gameplay, what's the difference between following and power? And I can say, well, there's not much difference except when you play a special card that allows you to remove following or that, uh, to, to, to uh, replace um, one thing or the other. Yeah. But then how did you balance the special cards? Because all the special cards are a little different, right? Like the, the replaces or the remove cards, add cards? The, getting the special cards to be balanced was very, very difficult. And we took a very long time. We had a number of special cards in the beginning that were way too strong. Uh, Black Death was a special card at the beginning and would wipe out all the following in about three or four areas. 
and the only time I saw my uh, livelihood program coordinator very upset <laughs> <laughs> during nine months in Aceh was when his uh, followers were all eliminated by the Black Death. And he said, this is ridiculous. How can you make it so strong? This card should not be in the game. So uh, trying to, <laughs> we tried to make them as close as possible. What you'll see, of course, that the, the special cards that have a stronger impact will have a lower value to start with. So they are hard to score, but if they score, their effect is bigger. Uh, try and make sure that uh, the, the, the special cards of red and the special cards of green and the special cards of yellow have roughly the same uh, value or attraction. has been quite a long process of trying. Why did you make the obstruction larger than the influence? Uh, that's uh, because in the, the way the game works, one player starts and his or her teammate adds points. Yeah? So there is one starting card, and that card is supported by the partner in the team. So they will add support points. The two opponents play their cards, and they use their obstruct or oppose points. The thing is, uh, there are four seasons. You play four card games in one game year before you score the victory points. And in every card game, one player or one team has the advantage to decide the ties. So if the score is 8-8, eight, eight, one team will win or one team will lose depending on uh, the season that you are playing, the, the first, second, third or fourth card game. Now the thing is, if they would be equal, then in a uh, season, in a card game where you had the advantage, you would win too often. You would, because they would often, might often be tied. So if the oppose cards are slightly stronger, in this case 10% stronger, it balances for the fact that quite often the starting player is one who wins all ties. So to compensate for that, the obstruct needs to be slightly stronger. So you mentioned that some of the elements of this game are based on the card game you played when you were young. And I was wondering, these, uh, I find that the blockers, or whatever you want to call them, are a very interesting mechanic in the mm -hmm. game because they make it dangerous to play powerful cards. Yeah. Are these things, did you just come up with them during this, this development, or are they part of this original no, game? No, the original card game is actually, it's possibly most comparable to Bridge, but much simpler. Uh, I think the essence is the two, four, always four players and two teams against two, where you manage your hand not only for yourself, but in anticipation of what your partner might have or might not have, and what your opponents might have or might not have. So uh, the idea of blocking strong cards, I realized fairly soon uh, that both for the storytelling element, having strong cards and opposing block cards was very interesting. Rather than to have a large number of cards that are all sort of just values, you now look for special cards so that you can block a, speci a specific opponent card. Uh, obviously, also, the, the strong cards would be too easy to score if there was no uh, blocking mechanism. What you can say, it might, it might come, be most directly related to uh, the game uh, strate Stratego, you call it? where the marshal, the strongest piece, can be destroyed if the spy attacks it. So you, if you have a game where, if in the game mechanic some cards are much more powerful than others, you need to create some balancing uh, mechanism. Of course, in this card game it also really works well because remembering which cards are in or out becomes much more interesting if you have this mechanic. Uh, so what made you switch from it being in, in 1490 to 2025? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> good question. Uh, we decided early on we wanted to have medieval uh, Krakow, as I explained, and it should be <coughs> at a time when it was the capital of Poland. And that is in a time span that started roughly around the year 1100, 1000, uh, up to about... 1600, I believe. After that, uh, at some point, uh, well, Poland didn't always exist. Uh, 
And if it exists after some time, the, uh, uh, it moved to uh, to Warsaw. Uh, so we had this whole sp space of about 500 years where we wanted to put this. And I had already written quite a lot of these stories. So I had some idea what kind of things should be happening in this environment. Uh, rocket science. Uh, well, can't think of that many. Uh, I was looking at a time when this was the seat of uh, the royal family. There needed to, it needed to be a time of war, of conflict with surrounding uh, uh, countries. And there were several, of course, as you can imagine, to choose from. Originally, we put uh, 1490 because I had a card called the Copernicus Code. Uh, Copernic, the, the uh, ast we'll call it scientist or astronomer. Yeah, astronomer. He uh, studied in this town. I found that out very early, and I thought, hmm, that's a lot nice. Let's have a card about that. But then I found out sometime later that in the year 1490, the king had no family, had no children. <laughs> and we already had pictures with daughters and <laughs> stories about his wife. And he thought, hmm, it's better if this guy uh, had a family, the, the king of Poland at the time. And then we already had... One of the very early cards was a palace coup, which shows the king of Poland sitting on a sitting on his uh, his, his throne, and some people trying to uh, scare him out of his wits. And that king that Melchior drew was very very short, and I then I searched all through Polish history trying to find a time when there was war, the king had a family, and possibly he was also short. <laughs> And to my big excitement, there was uh, a man called Lokitek, who was king of Poland in around from 1324 to 1328, I believe, <laughs> only a few years. And in Polish, his nickname was the elbow, as high as your elbow or something. <laughs> so uh, in English, they called him Lokitek the Short, which was much nicer. Uh, so having already the picture of a very short king and all these other things matching up meant... So I remember writing an email to Melchior from Indonesia saying, oh, I've done some research, and uh, actually I'd rather like to move it to 1325. Are you okay with that? And he wasn't too sure because he said, well, I've been drawing all these people's clothes <laughs> yeah, well, based on the idea that it was 1490, so I'm going to look at this. And we looked at whether or not there was gunpowder or some of these things we had more or less. Thank you. Um, so go, go ahead and finish up. Yep. That was the reason. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're out of time, so thank you everybody, and thank, thank you very much, so Peter, much. for coming by. It was great. <laughs>